The third generation of Pokemon games changed everything. Gone were the times when we could sit back with our Game Boy and explore a strange world filled with strange creatures. All of a sudden, we needed to do more than play. Spin-offs, events, movies, card games, we had to live, breathe, and spend all our money on Pokemon. Simply enjoying a good video game was not enough anymore. Hi, I am Lyra. For the past few months, we have been achieving living Pokedexes in Pokemon games together. We have journeyed from the timeless route of Kanto in Pokemon Blue to the legendary beasts filled Johto in Pokemon Silver. But what is a living dex exactly? Well, the goal is to obtain every single Pokemon. It is a very arbitrary challenge, taking the catchphrase, gotta catch them all, a bit too literally. But it has allowed us to thoroughly enjoy the older generations and fulfill childhood dreams. But Gen 3 introduced a huge hurdle to this challenge. It is common knowledge the first two generations were absolutely broken in almost every way. And while weirdly charming, Game Freak decided to fix this. Ruby and Sapphire were remade from the ground up, and weren't completely busted anymore. But doing so, and with the release of the brand new Game Boy Advance, removed the possibility of trading with previous versions, making our collection work a lot more difficult. Although, if you are not looking to catch every Pokémon, Ruby and Sapphire introduced quite a bit of improvements to the formula. First, the two versions now feature differences other than just seemingly random Pokémon distributions, with changes to the main plot and exclusive legendary Pokémon. In practice, the differences are small, but at this point, anything is good to justify releasing two copies of the same game, given trading Pokémon was not a novelty anymore. Second, the addition of elements like Pokémon abilities, natures, and double battles, which add some much-needed variety to the core mechanics. These may have their detractors, especially in the competitive scene, but are great fun for casual players. Third, a plethora of quality of life changes to the game. More than just glitches being fixed, several mechanics were modified to be more in line with how they work in recent generations. The most important for me is PC management. I played a lot of Gen 1 and 2 lately, and it is by far the improvement I am looking forward to the most. Unfortunately, we are still trying to catch all the available Pokémon, and looking at Pokémon capture and exclusivity in Gen 3 paints a grim picture. In order to catch all the version-exclusive Pokémon, we need five games. Both newest versions Ruby and Sapphire, both Gen 1 remakes Fire Red and Leaf Green, and Emerald. To add insult to injury, any trade from Fire Red and Leaf Green to a non-Gen 1 remake game requires to complete the Savy Island questline, only accessible after beating the Elite Four. By the way, did I say five games? I'm sorry, I meant seven, and a whole additional console, as playing the GameCube games Pokémon Colosseum and Pokémon XD Gale of Darkness are necessary to obtain Lugia and Ho-Oh and are also the most convenient way to get a bunch of unique Pokémon. See, some of those Pokémon are available in the mainline games, but are stupidly difficult to obtain. The three legendary beasts can be encountered in Fire Red and Leaf Green, but also require finishing the Civi Islands, and only one of the beasts will show up, depending on the starter we chose meaning one legendary beast per completed save file. It is still not as bad as in Emerald, where Professor Birch will reward us for completing the Hoenn Pokedex with a single Johto starter. If we want all three, and we do, we have to complete three Hoenn Dexes in three different save files. We can trade the Pokemon, but that's still a lengthy endeavor. Which leads me to a simple question. Given the hoops we must jump through to obtain so many unique Pokémon, 
how are we supposed to find other people to trade with? Making Pokemon that much more difficult to obtain breaks the concept of version exclusivity. In Gen 1 and 2, you can realistically complete your Pokedex by meeting other people, as you only need common Pokemon from the version you don't own. To complete a Pokedex with the help of other people in Gen 3, we need to find several people who all own different versions, who finished the game and picked a different starter than us, that are willing to catch a difficult roaming legendary and trade it away, and that have completed a Hoenn Pokedex. Anyone committed enough is likely to buy all the versions themselves, which seems to be Game Freak's intended goal. And even then, they are still forced to play the side games and participate in Pokemon events. And that's where we get to the core of the issue. Before Ruby and Sapphire, the mainline games were the central pillar of the Pokemon franchise, with all the tie-in products taking inspiration from them. Since Gen 3, the core games are only a part of the Pokemon franchise. It is no surprise the tagline, gotta catch them all, was dropped, as we cannot catch them all, with the National Pokedex impossible to complete at the release of Ruby and Sapphire. A decision which only makes sense if you see the game as one piece of a bigger Pokemon puzzle. I wouldn't take umbrage with this puzzle if it wasn't so expensive to complete. The new unofficial tagline in Gen 3 seemed to be how much are you willing to spend, as the maximum number of Pokemon you could obtain was based on how much money you had. Like previously mentioned, if we want all the Pokemon, we need to own a Game Boy Advance with Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Emerald. To trade between versions, we then need either a second GBA with a link cable, or a GameCube with a GBA link cable, and either Pokemon Colosseum or Pokemon XD. If you won't, or can't, get event Pokemon, you need to get both GameCube games anyway. While we're at it, how do you rationalize buying a game made by a completely different developer? The main reason to play the GameCube spin-offs is to obtain content for the more successful mainline games, not the core enjoyment they provide. When you can't stand on your own and have to rely on other games to justify your existence, it doesn't bode well. And I haven't played either spin-offs, so I have no opinion, positive or negative. It just seems like a very... contrived experience. Spin-off games are not a new thing, but they were completely optional in the past. Not anymore. Now, if we want to avoid purchasing so many games, we can choose the event Pokemon route instead. Gen 3 very much encourages it too, to the point of over-relying on them. Where Gen 1 and 2 had a single forced event Pokemon each, Mew and Celebi respectively, in Gen 3, if we want to use the GBA games only, six of our Pokemon will need to be obtained through events. Mew, Lugia, Ho-Oh, Celebi, Jirachi, and Deoxys. And events are terrible for video game preservation. What are we supposed to do now that these games are old and events for them don't exist anymore? Some Pokemon are just impossible to obtain legitimately. The stance of Game Freak and Nintendo on the matter is crystal clear. Why do you care about old games? Just buy the newest ones. Great. Thank you. Even back then, events were bad. The travel is going to cost you, unless you are one of the lucky few who lives next to a distribution place. And they're just... dumb. You want Mew? Well, you're in luck, because Toys R Us is celebrating the anniversary of its mascot, Jeffrey. Because that's what I'm looking forward to the most in Pokemon games. Jeffrey. This is my biggest complaint with the concept of events. How special does it feel to send my cartridge via mail, then get it back a week later with a mythical Pokemon on it? 
or to show up at a store I've never been to, in a place I will never visit again, and ask someone who doesn't care about Pokemon to make one appear in one of my boxes. It is such a blatant ploy to trick people into engaging with brands as part of a cross-marketing deal. And most of the Pokemon you can obtain are the mythical or legendary ones. Doesn't feel very mythical or legendary, does it? Things get somehow worse, because I've only been talking about events based in North America so far. If you happen to live in a country other than the US, Japan, or the UK, it is capital city or bust. And that's if you live in a country that even has events. Which brings us deeper down the bottom of Gen 3's barrel. Region Lock. Remember when I mentioned you could get unique Pokemon by playing the side games? Some of them are not even obtainable this way. For instance, Celebi. Theoretically, by completing Pokemon Colosseum and inserting its bonus disc, we can obtain the Gen 2 Mythical. Except this is only the case in the Japanese version of Colosseum. And since the GameCube is a region locked console, we would have to play the Japanese version on the Japanese console. The Game Boy Advance is fortunately not region locked. But it doesn't matter, because Japanese Colosseum only connects to Japanese Gen 3 games, making Celebi an event only Pokemon. What about the Gen 1 mythical, Mew? Well, our good old friend Jeffrey is actually the only way to obtain it, because the in game events to encounter Mew starts with the old C map, an item only distributed in Japan. Frustrating, huh? Welcome to the world of being European and liking video games. A world where classics like Final Fantasy VI or Chrono Trigger, lauded by many as some of the most important games ever released, never released. And when niche games do come out, they are ported directly from the US version, without any localization work done. In a silly way, they are the reason I speak English now. Learning the language is a necessity if you want to play lesser known games. I am thankful for it though, as being able to speak English has allowed me to reach an audience on YouTube and make videos you seem to enjoy. But enough positivity, let's talk about how Europeans got the short end of the stick in Gen 3. The Pokemon Colosseum bonus disc, which contained Celebi in Japan and Jirachi in the US, is not a thing in Europe. To get Jirachi, European players need to purchase a third game, Pokemon Channel. Additionally, after the commercial failure of the Game Boy Advance peripheral e-reader in North America, production was stopped and the e-reader was never released in Europe. Given one of the main functionalities for the add-on was to add extra content to the Pokemon games, including the unique Eon ticket in Ruby and Sapphire, European players were, once again, completely forgotten. So, why? Why did Game Freak and Nintendo decide to break a solid game into so many tiny pieces? For the same reason every big company salivates at the idea of having a sprawling cross-media empire. Money. It makes sense. And I won't blame a company for wanting to make money. I will blame them when they do it by lowering the quality of the end product. But hey, a company is a company, they will make money, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong until you remember their target audience. Kids. Then you realize how predatory these tactics are. Because kids don't ask questions. They don't know any better, so they will follow whatever you say. You need to buy seven games over two consoles. Let me ask my parents. You have to care about everything that says Pokemon on it, regardless of the media, people behind it, or how relevant it is to the main games. I love Pokemon, 
so I don't have a problem with that. And once they grow up, they won't even ask themselves if releasing two versions of the exact same game is still relevant or necessary anymore. Because this is the way it has always been. I mean, why have one finished game when you can have two unfinished ones? <sighs> I apologize for being so cynical. But it's hard not to be. Especially when you used to be one of these kids. See, I started playing Pokemon when Red and Blue released. I can still recall the birthday where I got my Game Boy Color, Pokemon Blue, and then disappeared from the surface of the Earth. I was transported, enraptured by this unknown world full of fantastical creatures. I remember the summer I spent, a few years later, playing Pokemon Silver day and night, marveling at how the in-game world mimicked the real world, with Pokemon in locations changing depending on the time of day. And then Gen 3 came out, and the magic of Pokemon faded away. Suddenly, I was supposed to buy several games on two different systems I didn't own, participate in events happening on the other side of the country, and consume as much Pokemon content as possible. All the while, knowing most of the unique and interesting stuff would only ever happen in Japan or the US, and never see the light of day in Europe. I was seemingly being punished for not having enough money, not living in the right place, and not being able to travel or import hardware. Things I, as a young teen, had no influence over. And that is why I didn't play Gen 3 back then. All the negative aspects I mentioned are not a theoretical. They are what drove me away from Pokemon. At the end of the day, my main issue with Gen 3 is not the quality of the core games. If anything, they feature clear improvements and intelligent additions to the formula. Or the quality of the tie-in products, for that matter. My main issue is the fact I can talk at length about a game without mentioning the game part. Most of what Gen 3 inspires is version-exclusive, cross-connectivity, spin-offs, business decisions, and everything else other than getting lost in a brand new world. Far are the times when we could just boot up the game, enjoy ourselves, and have a complete experience. All that side content wasn't added on top of what was already there. It was removed from the mainline games, to be served piecemeal later, pulling Gen 3 back from being truly amazing. Having played Gen 1 and 2 at length recently to complete a living Pokedex has made that shift in focus painfully obvious. Wait, the living Pokedex! That's right, I almost forgot! It all started with us trying to catch every single Pokémon. The release of Ruby and Sapphire may have brought dubious changes to the franchise, but I am still very excited to actually play the games. Finishing the previous Pokémon generation allowed me to enjoy and appreciate the early games in ways I hadn't before. I am confident the Gen 3 Living Dex will do the same. Who knows, I may end up loving Pokémon Colosseum and XD. And for all the weirdness the spin-off content introduced, there is fun to be had in figuring out the best way to capture every Pokémon using several games. So let us put our focus back on the challenge itself and plan for the Gen 3 Living Pokédex. There are a lot of ways to approach getting a Living Dex, and to make it as fun and rewarding as possible, we need to establish a set of rules to follow. Considering how much there is to cover, I tried to keep to the spirit of what makes the Living Pokédex enjoyable. All the games we play start from a fresh new game file. Our main version, where we will centralize all the Pokémon, is Emerald. It is simply the definitive Gen 3 version, releasing after the previous four GBA games with better graphics, a different storyline, and a more complete Pokédex, among other improvements. From there, we have a choice. 
do we play as legitimately as possible and accept we won't be fully completing the living decks, or admit it is impossible to play Gen 3 fairly and cheat all the event Pokémon available? Well, how about both? I want to see all Gen 3 has to offer. So, we will cheat and unlock every single event possible in Pokémon Emerald, while also playing the side games for the explicit purpose of obtaining legendary Pokémon. This means, instead of doing the smart thing and picking the easiest way to get Lugia and Ho-Oh, we will get two versions of each. It is extremely silly, but if we are going down the rabbit hole, let's do it right. Finally, apart from events, no other cheats are allowed. No glitches either, which are different from cheating, but tend to make the game less fun. Catching Pokémon just isn't the same with an endless supply of Master Balls. To help us complete a living Pokédex, I used my skills as a web developer and made a website. It features all the encounter data in both the GBA and GameCube games, as well as a Pokédex tracker, so you can follow along and complete your own living decks. If you only want the Hoenn Pokédex, there's an option for that too. It took a lot of work to get everything set up, so if you find the website useful or have any feedback or suggestions, be sure to let me know. Using all the data gathered, I was able to plan the path forward. So here is the Gen 3 Living Dex journey. First, we play our main version, Pokémon Emerald, until the end, so it can receive all the Pokémon from other games. We then play a Gen 1 remake and unlock trading with other versions. We complete Pokémon Colosseum and Pokémon XD Gale of Darkness to obtain Lugia and Ho-Oh. We catch all the version-exclusive Pokémon in Ruby, Sapphire, Fire Red, and Leaf Green. We catch every remaining Pokémon in Emerald, as well as evolve them and obtain all the eggs we need. Get ready for this step. It will be a doozy. We then complete the challenge by getting all the event Pokémon in Emerald. I spent most of our time lamenting the changes Gen 3 made to the Pokémon franchise. But it doesn't deter me from completing this challenge. The road ahead may be long and treacherous, but don't think for a second I am not excited to finally start the Gen 3 Living Pokédex. Because I am! And I hope you are too. If it is the case, we will meet again soon on Twitch for our first steps in Pokémon Emerald. See you then. As you have probably guessed, making the website and this video took quite a bit of time. So now more than ever, the support of every single patron has been precious. And I would like to thank all of you, especially Jonas C, Chris Lunders, Kelzini, Milk Milk Monk, and Lucas Maximilian Leur. I hope you find this video informative and entertaining. Thank you very much for your time, and I wish you a wonderful day.